All right, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever it is that you are tuning in from. Welcome to TEDx Laveau. My name is Caitlin Brady. I am the Associate Director of Undergraduate Programs and Recruitment here at the Laveau College of Business. We are so excited to have so many of you with us tonight. And to kick things off, I want to introduce our Dean of the College, Dr. Vibhas Madan, to say some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Caitlin. And it's great to see everybody here this evening. So it's really my pleasure to welcome all of you, current students, alumni, admitted students from all over I can see. Again, this is uh, really great to see everybody here this evening, afternoon and morning, as Caitlin said. Uh, I do wanna say, you know, the TEDx uh, LeBeau series has really become integral to the student experience at LeBeau. And it's something which has turned out to be really special. And it's something which I see where the students and you know, alumni come and express themselves openly, talk about some of the things which are really internally important to them and you really get to see how people feel. And it's, I find this a really powerful platform uh, over the years now. And you know, the focus of uh, most of these uh, topics are all pretty much on uh, diversity and inclusion. And this is something which is truly at the heart of what we believe at in at Drexel and LeBeau. And it's really part of our fundamental core values. And you know, so this is something which I've looked forward to every time I see it come up. And we are here today. You know, you couldn't come to us, we come to you as we always say. So again, it's really great to see all of you here. And I'm truly proud of all of our alums and students who really come here and talk about their true feelings and share their stories. So I'm looking forward to listening to all of you today and would like all of you to participate and enjoy the program. Caitlin? Great, thank you so much, V. And before we continue, I do wanna thank our mentors who serve on LeBeau's Diversity and Inclusion Group who are here with us tonight. So each of our speakers is assigned a mentor from LeBeau to help them frame their speech. And we have Shauna Morris, Raquel Ardondo, and Noor Jemmy. So thank you to the three of you for helping these speeches really come to life. Um, to our listeners, to our audience, I encourage you to kind of cheer our presenters and our speakers along as they go. So you might see your reaction button at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to give them a thumbs up or a round of applause as you agree with what they say or at the culmination of their speech. But let's really dive right in, everybody. So our first speaker today is Chady Fonse. Chady is a junior at the Lebeau College of Business studying finance. Chady's talk is entitled A Pandemic's Guide to Mental Health. Chady. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to everyone who could be here. Challenging circumstances that we're currently in, and while I wish I could say I'm making the most of my time, if I'm being honest, I'm not. This pandemic has taken a toll on my mental health and has made me feel a level of sadness I haven't felt in quite a while. I've been home for 67 days now, and in those 67 days, life has certainly changed a lot. In those 67 days, I've had three mental breakdowns, each one consisting of the ugly crying and a lot of what-if scenarios. Each one felt like a blow to the chest. It felt like I couldn't improve. But I managed to pick myself up using the breathing exercises that I learned in therapy and I regained my composure, only to realize that a lot of the challenges that I'm going through are challenges that people all over the world are going through and that I'm not alone. So, I thought it would be a good idea to put my breathing exercises into use and take a moment with all of you to breathe in and breathe out and talk about something that is important now more than ever, which is mental health. Mental health refers to the cognitive, behavioral, and emotional well-being of a person. Mental health affects the way we think, how we act, how we feel. Poor mental health is caused when an excess of demands is placed on the person basically going to the point that in stressful times, your mental health is at risk. And I think it's safe to say that this pandemic is a very stressful time. In this pandemic, there are a variety of stressors like the virus, not knowing when you could see your loved ones, unemployment, the list goes on and on. And what's sad is, is that the same thing many mental illnesses feed off of, so does this pandemic, such as isolation, being alone, fear of the unknown, now, I know that I am not the only one feeling the toll that this pandemic has on my mental health. In fact, even the people who are more mentally situated prior to the pandemic are saying something feeling off in our routine. 
And what's worse is, is that now everyone thinks this is a time to be inspirational and aspirational, to do all the things on the bucket list that you haven't gotten to, or learn a new skill, or learn a new language. But I'm here to tell you that it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to want to scream and cry and shout. It's okay to miss your loved ones and all the things that you could and should have been doing if things were a little bit different. It's okay to not be okay. But what's not okay is the way that society looks at mental health. It is a problem and we are going to talk about it because we are not gonna let this pandemic silence our concerns. To share a little bit of my story, I decided to go to therapy when I was 18 and in college. And the idea of it absolutely terrified me. It terrified me because I had grown up with the idea that the people that go to therapy are weak. I in fact have to hide from a lot of my loved ones that I went to therapy because I know that they'll say, well, there was nothing actually wrong with you. That there was no real reason that you're in pain. And while my tears can say otherwise, What's a mental illness if I can't physically prove that it's there? If I can't put a Band-Aid on it and make it go away? And even on the days where physical symptoms did arise, the days where I couldn't sit still because I was shaking so much, or I cried myself to sleep at night, well, they were saying, you're just being overdramatic. There's nothing really wrong with you. I know now that I am not defined by the mental struggles that I go through. And I wanted to extend the logic that we are not defined by this quarantine. There is light at the end of the tunnel for all of us. And we don't have to let this pandemic get to us. There are so many online resources like online therapy, teen talks, hotlines, organizations like the Jed Foundation, which spreads mental health awareness. And if those resources aren't available to you, or you're uncomfortable reaching out to them. There's stuff like taking five minutes a day to walk outside and get some fresh air, or taking five minutes a day to breathe in and out, or FaceTime or video chatting your loved ones. All of that can release the stress that this pandemic is putting on you. It's easy to suffer in silence, to not know what to say or to whom, but I ask that you not shut the doors on the people around you to open up, to start the conversation. Because once you do, you may not know the amount of, amount of doors that you're opening up for yourself and the people around you. Even in this pandemic, it is a privilege to take a mental health break. So I ask that for everyone who can, to please do, to take the time to rest and recuperate. And I hope you have the opportunity to heal. And for the people who can't, who don't have the resources usually there to assuage you, to know that you are never alone, that while we may be divided in our households, that does not mean we are divided in the problems that we are going through. We don't have to let this pandemic define us. I believe there is light at the end of the tunnel for all of us. And while we're living in challenging circumstances right now, we don't have to let them define us. I feel your pain, but I believe that we will survive this. And I'm asking for all of you to hang in there to see yourselves come through. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to feel sadness, but please don't let this quarantine and the progress that you've all made. The world is not the same as it was 67 days ago. So let this pandemic start the conversation about mental health because it's important to talk about. Because in the end, there's hope for all of us struggling, and progress can start with doing something as simple as taking that moment to breathe in and breathe out. Thank you. Katie, a powerful message. Thank you so much for kind of sharing your heart there and your story. Again, if we could give Katie encouragement with those reactions and also via the chat feature, right? If you wanna comment or share words of encouragement, that's that form to do that. I'm happy to bring up our next speaker, a Lebeau alum, Nicholas Lombardi. Nicholas is a 2016 Lebeau graduate who majored at MIS and business analytics. Nicholas's topic is supplier diversity and inclusion. Welcome, Nicholas. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me on the topic of supplier diversity, inclusion matters. We can all think of a time 
when we're more than qualified to make the sports team, join the club, or get the job or internship you've always wanted, and what it could have meant for your future had it happened. Looking back, it probably wasn't a great feeling. However, imagine how it might have felt if you were more than qualified, but never even provided the chance to take your shot, interview for the job or position you've always dreamed of, because the establishment was simply never challenged. They weren't looking for new members or simply didn't want to change. These scenarios are upsetting, frustrating, and might make you question yourself, your purpose, and what you are really trying to do with your life. However, if we think about the, these type of consequences they can have on the macro level, whether it be within our governments or large corporations, the effects could be massive. To help understand this, we must realize the examples we see in our everyday lives. If you're like me and take the subway to and from work, during the commute, you will encounter almost every type of person from every walk of life. However, I bet very few of us take the time to realize the income inequality that we are surrounded with and the lack of opportunity that has created it. The next thing we must ask ourselves is, what are the effects of inclusion to our society as a whole and what they may be missed out on by not providing opportunities to everybody in our communities? Studies show that innovation is bred from diversity, which introduces new viewpoint and perspective that leads to positive change. For example, companies who have above average diversity within their management team have seen innovation-related revenue that is nearly twice of the companies who do not. And a separate study showed that for each 1% increase in the rate of gender diversity, there's a 3% increase in sales. While many focus on diversity at the individual level, not many realize supplier diversity and inclusion programs are equally as prevalent and important. In fact, supplier diversity programs have been put into place on the federal level dating back to the Nixon administration and have been built upon by all administrations since then. Despite efforts on a local, regional, and national level, the representation and opportunity is unfortunate reality for many small businesses across America who employ more than 50% of the workforce or about half of those employers are diverse or minority owned. Despite the overwhelming number of diverse minority owned businesses, they only represent 6.1% of annual revenue and grow 22 times slower on average than a non-minority owned business. Based on these numbers and the fact that minorities make up 40% of our current population, it's easy to identify that minority owned businesses endure challenges that many others do not. A large part of this is due to the obstacles minority and women owned businesses incur in obtaining funding to help their business grow. This is largely due to the upfront investment that can be required to obtain funding from banks and the income inequality that exists within the United States. According to data published by the U.S. Census Bureau in 2011, in terms of median income, Hispanics only earn 12% of what non-minority individuals earn and African Americans only earn 8%. Without access to capital, minority-owned business often employ fewer people, have fewer sales and resources than an optimally funded business, which puts them at a huge disadvantage in the marketplace. This is especially prevalent at large corporations who demand a lot from the suppliers they work with in terms of the goods and services they offer and the prices they can provide it for. Due to the economies of scale that large firms can leverage, small businesses are often left behind as fewer suppliers are leveraged to provide more goods and services at a decreased cost. However, business also realizes the impact of diversity amongst not only their workforce, but within the suppliers they partner with. Leaving the question, how can corporations best utilize small minority owned business within their organization? The answer to that question is an emphasis on supplier diversity within the procure procurement process of large corporations. Within these programs, suppliers are encouraged to double down on their strengths and specialize within one or two areas of focus. This means informing small business not to do or be everything, so they can focus on their strongest assets and build a solid foundation to grow. Once competence is gained in that area, the footprint can begin to expand. In addition to creating a supplier base that's focused on specialization, the approach from the purchasing organization must also ensure the inclusion of minority-owned businesses on nearly every opportunity. This would include scenarios where they are often out-representing non-minority businesses. 
No matter what the circumstance, inclusion is an integral component of a successful supplier diversity program. Using this approach in the organization I work for, we've helped small and diverse businesses cumulatively gain over $200 million in revenue over the last six years with an average diverse supplier revenue growth of 25% over the last three, with diverse suppliers represented on nearly all bids last year. The benefit of supplier diversity programs, however, goes far beyond the bottom line of each company involved. These businesses often dedicate themselves to making a direct impact on the communities they come from by giving back to their community and supporting the causes they believe in. For example, my organization partners with an African-American woman-owned business who places a focus on the employment of single mothers within the city of Baltimore. The program was created not only to hire, but to train and promote single mothers while also allowing them the flexibility to work from home, to take care of their family, and provide an opportunity they may have otherwise not had. Another example is of a disabled veteran-owned business that has created a program to hire, train, and place veterans in well-paying jobs at many of their clients' locations. This population has served us greatly, and now it's time to serve them in return. And there are many other examples, just like the two I just went through. As you can see, by simply including and presenting opportunities to diverse and minority-owned businesses, a lasting impact is made within the communities that are served. Opportunity creates a ripple effect for all those who are included. Looking back to the beginning of my career and during my time at Drexel, I could have never imagined being here, advocating for supplier diversity. However, over the last three years, working with the, with, excuse me, working with the Pinnacle Group, a Hispanic woman-owned company, has become something that's a daily focus of mine. This is because of the value Pinnacle brings and the communities that are served, both by the way of community services and the supplier diversity programs we manage. Seeing and learning about the impact of supplier diversity is truly rewarding because it goes beyond the bottom line. In closing, I'd like to challenge all of you to consider what, looking beyond what is familiar, whether it be in your everyday life, a new hobby, or your next internship or job. You never know where it may take you, but more importantly, where it may take others. Thank you. Nicholas, thank you so much for that. I mean, your, your, um, you know, your top, your statistics were really poignant and that message is really, really important for us to hear. So I appreciate you taking the time to put that together. And it sounds like everybody else really enjoyed that as well. Our next presenter as we move along is Shreya Kasoro. So Shreya is a first year student at the Laveau College of Business studying legal studies. Shreya's talk is entitled Shifting the Cultural Nar Narrative Through Storytelling. Shreya? Um, yeah, can you see my screen actually? Not yet. No, if you just want to hit that share screen button. And as Shri is kind of pulling this together, I will share with our admitted students who are joining us. You know, Shri is a first year. So imagine in a year from now or even come the fall, yourself might be giving a TED Talk with us. So looks like Shri, you're, you're good to go now. I'll leave it to you. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, namaste. Assalamu alaikum. Bonjour. Hola. Ciao. Ni hao. Dear duet. Prevet. I haven't even finished the greetings from one third of the world yet. Imagine about the rich cultural diversity and heritage we are surrounded with. But have you realized that with this, we have established our cultural narratives to be driven by our preconceived notions and stereotypes. Today, I'm here to make an attempt to help you experience my journey and how it has shaped me. Welcome to my TED Talk on Shifting Cultural Narrative Through Storytelling. About three years ago, I moved from India to New Jersey. And then I moved to Virginia. And I'm currently attending college in Philadelphia. So you might get an idea that I kind of love traveling. But more than that, I love immersing myself in new cultures and understanding how culturally aware people are. So when I first came to America, it was a completely new experience for me from my way of lifestyle to the people I've met. So let's start with my journey. Scene set 
to my high school. My high school in New Jersey was completely different from the education system I was used to in India. When I walked through that door, I walked through hallways full with green lockers, people hustling in corners. Some were super fashionable, some dressed as if they hadn't even taken a shower that day. Amidst all this chaos, I walked into the first class that day. And as a new kid, I obviously sat in a corner, tried to be with myself and try to figure out how to like get things around. And then that's when I felt a tap on my shoulder. And I turned back and there was this fellow classmate of mine. And he came up to me and asked, do you know what a pizza is? And that is when I was shocked. And I jumped upon him and was like, of course I know what a pizza is. I'm not an alien. That was a moment I went into a state of shock. I couldn't understand why someone would ask me something so obvious yet so irrelevant. But I decided to teach him about where I came from and that I know what a pizza is and what pasta, burgers and fries are. I could have walked away that day, taking it as an offensive or a racist remark. But that would have only left that classmate of mine culturally unaware and would have probably led him to repeat a similar mistake later on. So I believe that the idea of sharing our stories and experiences, our culture with people is a two-way process. The person who is new to our culture has the responsibility to talk about it, enlighten people around them. And the person on the other side has the duty or being recipro reciprocative about it, because that is how we move forward and be able to turn the page over and write a new narrative. So after this moment, I decided that it is time that I break my barriers and think beyond. So let's try, dive right into shifting cultural narrative through storytelling. But let's go down and understand what a cultural narrative is. It is a story of a community. What binds them together? Their history. That is what is all this about. So cultural narrative is not just limited to one's religion, race, or identity. It could go to the extent of personal choices, lifestyle. Um, and trust me when I say that cultural narrative has a lot to do with your personal choices and lifestyle is because when I came to the US, I disliked toilet paper. And three years later, I still do. In this journey, I realized that toilet paper is a significant part of American lifestyle. And I've slowly started to adapt to it. And understanding this, these minuscule details of a culture within a larger culture is crucial in understanding what drives people to certain decisions and why they do what they do. So we have talked enough about pizzas and toilet papers, let's move on and deal with some head-on issues, like people. So how do you write a cultural narrative? How do you share your story? How do you go around, break these boxes around you and think beyond? Well, there are three ways to it. The first step is having the idea of breaking your stereotypes. Second, learning to have a similar feeling than being different. And third is coexistence with your differences. Have you guys ever met someone who is completely different from you and has cultural differences at a height greater than Mount Everest? Well, let me tell you, I have, and that was in America. So let's set the scene to, to my high school again. After a couple of weeks of knowing people and people learning how to pronounce my name, I slowly started to find a way around in the school. And there was this one class in particular that actually connected me to the school, it was my English class. And more than that was the person in my English class who brought me closer to understanding the entire world of culture. Her name is Rania. And let me tell you a story of how she's related to this. So the first day I walk into my class, I was surprised, thrilled, fascinated by her. 
I started texting my friends back home. Guess who I met today? Now you must be wondering, why am I so excited? Because she was the first Pakistani that I ever met in my life. And being an Indian, it was a very big deal for me. Leaving the political nitty aside, the basic gist is India and Pakistan have had a painful past and people there tend to dislike each other. But when I came here, I was completely thrilled on meeting a first Pakistani ever. But that poor girl had no clue why I was feeling so fascinated and thrilled because for her, I was like the thousandth Indian. I bombarded her with so many questions about, oh, have you been to Pakistan? Oh, are we same? Do we eat the same food? That girl found that I was weird and clingy. But that's how our friendship started because I made the step of breaking my preconceived notions. So let's move on to the step two, having the feeling of similarity then difference. I started to bond with her on things that we were passionate about, the things that we share, like Bollywood movies, food, and the rantings of brown parenting, of course. But in this journey, we definitely learned about each other and had a cultural growth of understanding. She taught me a lot about her religion, about her culture back in Pakistan. She even told me the significance of why they celebrate Ramadan, Eid. And she came to so many of Indian festivities like Holi and Diwali, that it was surprising to me see that how culturally integrated we were, which led me to move to the phase three of our friendship that was coexisting with differences. Of course, we do have our share fair of differences, but the moment those differences went away was when the first time I met her grandparents. I felt a feeling of so much warmth and affection that they showered on me and my family. That was completely, that completely awestruck me because we belonging to different parts of the world, having painful history, yet we found a commonality, yet we connected with each other. I think that's what means about coexistence. Well, we do have our fights, of course, politics to Bollywood actors. She doesn't like Priyanka Chopra that much, but I kind of am a fat, big fan of her. So yeah, we do have our fights, but aside from that, we have learned to help our friendship grow and learn from each other through intellectual and cultural curiosity. So when we come to the end of today's TED Talk, we have to understand that the two fancy terms, diversity and inclusion, have long been spoken about. But have you ever realized, is it really being implemented in the world by people? Does it really play a role? Unfortunately, we do not understand its true meaning. People have started a false pretense of accepting people and have failed to understand stories just to bolster their image, brand, companies. I think that's not the way to write a new narrative. It is time when we flip the new page to write a narrative, it, we have to learn new stories, open our minds and accept people with new experiences, new cultures. And that is how we move forward today. And trust me, when you start knowing stories about people from where you're not, it's one of the most lifelong experiences which you can cherish. Thank you. Shreya, wow. I mean, your topic was storytelling and my goodness, can you tell a story? <laughs> Thank you so much for really sharing those important pieces with us and really walking us through that. That was fantastic. Last but not least, everybody, our final speaker is Brian Thomas. Brian is a senior at the Lebeau College of Business studying business and engineering. Brian's talk is entitled Bridging Diversity Through Creative Arts Therapy. Brian. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? You can hear you. Okay, cool. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see. Oh, wait. It's, it says um, host disabled attendee screen. Let's get you back in there. Well, in the meantime, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, that is correct. I am a senior at Drexel, studying business and engineering, finishing up this year. And definitely want to take this time to thank LeBeau and TEDx for this amazing opportunity to just have an open discussion about just diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion as a whole. And there's so many ways to take this topic and apply it to our individual walks and experiences. 
But for me, something that I've been able to take away from this topic is just how can I tie this in with my personal passions and then analyze that with what I've seen throughout my experience, collective experience of 22 years on this, on this earth. So today's topic is bridging diversity through creative arts therapy. Okay, so the story begins with three characters. So we have three characters here. First character's name is Brian. Second character's name is Joseph. Third character's name is Mevin. And so we have Brian and Brian is a college student trying to make that transition from his professional academic career into the actual real world and kind of is coming to a harsh realization that, hey, maybe there isn't a career or maybe there isn't a path forward for me to find a way to really tie in all my passions and interests into a professional career. So if that's the harsh reality, what do I do? Do I just keep doing things on the side and one day hope that my dreams come true or Brian's dreams come true? Do I, do I just go through the mundane motion of just pleasing other people and kind of going through the motions of just being a people pleaser without actually being honest with myself and kind of is in this this rut and cycle of depression and doesn't really know how to move forward at this crossroads of his life from translate, translating his journey from academically to professionally. And so that's just a brief glimpse of as where Brian is right now. And secondly, we have Joseph. And so Joseph is somebody that is 93 years of age, is a, is a veteran, is a senior citizen, um, has, has been in this moment of having so much independence and now he's reaching a stage in his life where he's becoming so dependent on his, his wife. And in that regards, he's not able to do things at his house the way he once was able to. And he feels like power is being stripped from him because his wife is the one that's running things. And so he's reaching a stage of dependency. And so there's a sense of brokenheartedness there and a sense of mourning. And lastly, the character we have here is Mevin. And Mevin is somebody that is a middle school student who is going into a transitional period because he was once regarded as a happy-go-lucky child, but then the harsh reality came for him when he went through a traumatic car accident. And as a result, he became paralyzed. And so now it's kind of the question as, is his identity rooted in how people view him as someone with a disability, as someone who suffered a car accident and is a victim to this? Or is his identity in who he was post and pre the car accident. So these are three characters. And so they're all in different walks of their life. One's just about to begin their career. One has done their career. And one is still understanding what they're passionate about and growing as a student in high school and middle school. So they're all three different characters, very diverse, but yet there's one common thread. Each of them feel a sense of brokenheartedness and each of them feel a sense of hopelessness because they're not able to be their authentic self, whether that's a past self or someone that they long to aspire to become. And so in all this, there, there was some common thread in the sense that we were all broken people. And, and so nonetheless, this picture right here, this is Joseph and this is Brian and I myself am Brian. So these were not characters, these are real life people. And so in my brokenness and in, in my questionable circumstances as what do I even want to do in my life? What is something I'm passionate about? Can I translate passions into something that I can actively exercise and implement in my day to day? And so in my moment of brokenness, I went to Joseph and needless to say, Joseph is somebody in my direct community, someone that was in my neighborhood, just a couple houses down and someone that I knew was also going through a tough time and definitely going through a season of brokenheartedness and mourning. And for me, I had passions in music, ministry, and mission work. And I thought, hey, instead of fixating and dwelling on the negative and fixating on just the lack of opportunity and what I'm doing in the now, why don't I take whatever resources I have and go to Joseph with my drum pad and my attitude and passion for music and just connect with him on that level? And so the relationship between me and Joseph didn't start with music in the beginning. It started with having conversations with him and his wife during dinner time, talking about politics and spirituality and just taboo topics that you wouldn't want to necessarily talk about, but just sitting with him and watching Fox News. So our relationship started like that, but then in having casual conversations and building more, more momentum, we were able to understand that he also had a passion for music. And hence, 
here's a moment where two broken people are really able to connect, not for the sake of what can I get out of you or what can you get out of me, more so how can we make the most of life together? And so as a result, we just had a bonding moment where we just played music. And here's a little clip of that. So such a simple act, in the moment, I didn't think much of it, but I knew that he was very joyful in that moment. And I, know in, I knew in that moment, he was bringing a great immense amount of joy to me. And I knew that what he was giving me was way more than I could ever give to him. And even just listening to his stories about being a war veteran and how he used to live life and how he had some challenges and how he overcame his challenges. And so if you look at the top right, you see that empty graphic of a person, yet when we came together, we were made full. And so that was just one interaction. And that's me and Joseph. But I also told you about a third character named Mevin. And so this is Mevin. And Mevin has now been paralyzed, but yet I knew Mevin before his car accident. And I knew him as a very rambunctious, very spirited child. And yet when this happened to him, I definitely mourned, um, mourned for him, but I also definitely knew that that same kid that I knew before the car accident was still there. And so for me, I thought, if he's somebody that you know, likes to listen to the music on the radio, let me do the same thing and go to him like I went, with, went to Joe and kind of build on this relationship of, despite our differences, despite that we've had different experiences of brokenheartedness and different life events in general, how can we connect on something that brings us together? And hence, we did the same thing. We played one of his favorite songs and we just let him be him. Again, a brief interaction, not looking for anything more than how can we live in the present moment and make the most of that interaction. And so again, two broken people. And in that broken process of just coming together, we were able to make each other uh, feel more alive in our passions and purpose in the moment now. And so as a result of all this, me reflecting on the moment of me connecting with Joseph as well as Mevin, I came to the real realization that I was so busy climbing my own ladder of just doing my coursework and being in my own little bubble that I really wasn't looking out to the needs of my direct community. And I wasn't really assessing the larger need for how to connect with people, irrespective of whether or not I'm in the same milestone or same age group as them. Even though I don't study the same thing they study major wise, I'm not the same age as them. And I necessarily don't have the same skin color as them. So collectively all together, I assessed this and I realized, hey, this, these connections brought me out of a moment of brokenness, but yet if I'm able to build upon this and connect with other people in the sense of using music as a vehicle, using our ability to connect, but also that being able to take us out of the negative mental feedback loop that we were always thinking about that was, that was keeping us in our own shell, um, connecting those two ideas of mental health and music therapy, it, it really enabled me to think, hey, how can I connect with music therapists? How can I connect with musicians and just mental health care professionals and kind of bring a service that would enable us to bridge the gap between all groups of people and also be able to pour into people's spirit holistically? And so as a result, I came up with this nonprofit and I've been able to curate a, an amazing team of people that are also on this call of a talented music therapists and mental health care professionals and even student volunteers where we are trying to, trying to alleviate the whole healthcare process from a holistic standpoint and focus on client-centered care in music therapy and mental health care. And so our brief structure is based off of those two service offerings of music therapy work and mental health care work. And the videos that you saw with Joseph and Mevin and myself were more on the music companionship care aspect, although music therapy care is a lot more um, in depth and a lot more clinically, cl clinically based. Um, it's definitely something that we're working in progress to make it more professional. But nonetheless, our high level strategy as just human beings and connecting with people of diverse backgrounds and bringing them from a sense of emptiness to wholeness was to make them feel like their younger selves or make them feel like the person that they once were when they were dreaming big and having aspirations to 
to keep pushing forward despite not knowing what tomorrow would bring. And so that brings us to my conclusion, just bridging diversity through creative arts therapy. It's such a broad topic. There's so many different facets to creative arts therapy, but first point, diversity is much more than your background. And we can't just limit it to our ethnic background. We can't just limit it to the language we speak. We can't just limit it to um, how we just look from a surface level. Diversity comes with, you know, diversity of thought, whether it be politically, spiritually, what passions and interests you have. And collectively, what, what, what is your journey? What is your story? Because even though there's so many differences, when we push into those differences, we can definitely find ourselves out of our comfort zone. But we as a person and we as the individual start to stretch ourselves to become somebody that is a lot more open-minded. And hence, the second point is, an open mind can lead to opportunity. I didn't go to Joseph's house. I didn't go to Mevin's house to necessarily birth a nonprofit, to birth uh, a platform to champion music therapy, to champion mental health care awareness. I solely went to their house just to get out of my head, get out of my depression, get out of my feelings of um, just misery so that I can better understand how other people are going through their struggles and being able to connect with them in an authentic and empathetic manner. So an open mind can definitely lead to opportunity. And lastly, you can agree to disagree with others. If I felt intimidated in my interactions with people, whether it be Joseph or Mevin, because they weren't necessarily from a similar background than me, then I would have missed out on such a cool opportunity to connect with so many other amazing individuals, whether that be professionally or personally. So when we can agree to disagree with others, a beautiful thing happens in the sense that we tend to broaden our horizons and we tend to be able to see issues and controversial topics in a more understanding and empathetic light. So those are just three simple topics. And as a result, it birthed a, a nonprofit called Heartbeat Mission. And I'm not here to plug our nonprofit in any way, but it's kind of like the name came to me because in my moment of brokenness, my heart was really hurting to the point where I thought I had to go to the doctor to get some type of medication because I didn't want to die of a heart attack right now. Not right now. Let me just graduate from Drexel University first and then maybe. But nonetheless, it's kind of like each of us have a heart. Although our heart may, be, our, although our heart may beat at different speeds, at different rhythms, and although our heart might come in different sizes and weights, at the end of the day, each of our hearts beat to give us the same function and purpose to live a life of meaning, to live a life that is very passionate and a life that is worth moving onward so that we can press on towards tomorrow. And so that's just a little high level overview of how we can use something as a passion to help us bridge diversity in such a subtle way in our community and having that ripple through and actually help people that are really brokenhearted and make them go from emptiness to wholeness. And so I thank you for this opportunity and I definitely um, enjoyed everyone else's speeches and thank you for taking the time today to listen. Brian, a great message. And so for you and your colleagues on the line, thank you for what you do, right? Um, but to all of our speakers today, truly, truly a phenomenal job. You should all be very proud of yourselves. Um, in closing and to kind of bring us to a close, I want to invite on our Associate Dean for Academic Programs Administration, Dr. Brian Ellis, to say some closing remarks. Well, well thank you, Caitlin. And again, I just want to echo uh, Caitlin's sentiments uh, to all the speakers, uh, Shadi, uh, Nicholas, Sharia, and Brian. Uh, you guys did a fantastic job. And, um, you know, these sessions never cease to uh, amaze me. I mean, unbelievable, even on this virtual platform. So one more virtual round of applause to the group. <laughs> um, that being said, I'd also like to thank Caitlin and the other mentors for really, uh, you know, putting this program together um, and, uh, you know, giving our students a voice because that's something that, you know, we proud ourselves on within the College of Business. So Caitlin and the other mentors and the, the DNI committee, I thank you for your support and your, and your service. And finally, to all the current students, alumni, and uh, our newly admitted students, you know, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is just a taste of uh, some what our new students can expect as uh, Drexel students moving forward. You know, hopefully, uh, shortly we'll be back on campus and we can have these sessions face to face. But again, um, you know, we we take D and I very seriously, and I would encourage everyone here on this call and 
in this session to continue to um, you know look for other opportunities to engage with us uh, and, and uh, this type of platform and all the wonderful things that we do within the college. So with that, again, great evening. I want to uh, again thank everybody for participating and coming out tonight, and I hope to see each of, each of you really soon. So thank you. Thanks, Caitlin. Awesome. Thank you all for joining us. Our speakers are going to hang on. If anybody does have any direct questions, you guys can direct chat them. But again, everyone stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to see you guys soon. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Shauna, for your help. Thank, Thank you, you to everyone that attended. Great job, speakers. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks again.